much for joining us this evening. We're going to um, walk you through how to see the interpretation in Spanish before we jump into the presentation. Gracias por estar aquí. Vamos a empezar. Um, antes de empezar a la presentación, les vamos a enseñar cómo pueden accesar um, esta junta en español en el momento sin escuchar, sin tener que escuchar inglés y español. Van a poder escuchar solo español toda la junta. This is the first time that we're doing this, so we welcome your feedback. The, the translation will be immediate, so when you click on this interpretation button, you'll be able to hear what we're saying in Spanish real time. Cuando es la primera vez que andamos intentando este tipo de interpretación a la misma vez que andamos teniendo la junta en inglés. Entonces, si eligen este botón en, la, en su pantalla, en su teléfono o en su computadora, van a poder elegir español o Spanish. Y eligiendo eso, va a poder cambiar el sonido um, a español. Cuando lo eligen, si lo eligen ahorita, van a parar de escuchar. Um, escucharme hasta que me, me cambien aquí la, um, el título a español y ya después voy a poder a traducir. However, we welcome your feedback. So if you don't like it and it's not making sense to you, please chat us or raise your hand and we can go back to traditional translation. Uh, si, no, si no está funcionando o el español del el, el director que está traduciendo es terrible, nos pueden hacer el comentario y vamos a, a cambiar la Vamos a cambiar la manera en que lo hacemos. Thank you. So you're just going to select Spanish after you click on interpretation like this. So my name is Farnaz Golshani and I'm the CEO at Environmental Charter Schools. Joined this evening by Danielle Kelsic, who's our Chief Academic Officer. Buenas tardes. La tecando ahorita es la directora Farnaz Goshani. And Dave Trejo, who's ECMS Gardena's principal, but is also going to be providing translation this evening. And our colleagues, Geneva Matthews, who's the ECMS Inglewood principal, and Casey Fabiero, who's the ECHS Lawndale principal, and Jeremiah David, who's the director of compliance and operations, who are all here in case you ask a question that's relevant to their area of focus. So I'm going to introduce why we're here. Uh, we're here tonight to share a new plan that the state has required all schools um, to y enseñarles el plan. an attendance plan. And the plan is really a response to everything that's happened since March of 2020. Go ahead, come on. And a lot has happened since March 2020. We've had a pandemic. We've had social uprisings. And we've all been um, suddenly introduced to distance learning. So you all have seen our priorities for the 2021 school year, and they are in direct response to the moment that we're in. Our priority to confront anti-Blackness and racism in our organization and the world is in response to the fact that we as an organization Though we have a very powerful mission statement that strives to create a more equitable and sustainable world, have not been able to create a more equitable and sustainable school environment, both for our students and our staff. And this is something that we are really trying to focus on strengthening. We're aligning our systems for effective and equitable distance learning in our response to the moment of COVID and all the closures. And we're deepening reading apprenticeship by focusing on disciplinary literacy and highlighting math. As many of you know, last year our focus was on reading apprenticeship and we are continuing that work. So the learning continuity and attendance plan is, is really asking schools to think about what did they learn from their experience in the spring? What do we learn from that sudden move to distance learning? And then what are our plans for 2020 in terms of how we're going to manage to do in-person learning during a pandemic, uh, how we're going to do uh, uh, distance learning, but even better than we did it the first time. How are we going to address any learning loss if students have fallen behind? What's our plan to catch them back up? And then how are, you, how are we going to support? How are we going to support? 
um, both in a normal year and also in, in this extraordinary situation. How are we going to support their mental health? How are we going to make sure they have good access to food? And then while all this is going on, how are we still going to maintain really good communication with our students and with our families, keep them engaged in the process so that we can be partners in this um, extraordinary adventure that we're on? One really important step to doing this work better in response to distance learning this year has been engaging our stakeholders. And we've made many efforts to engage our stakeholders, surveying students and parents, holding focus groups in town halls. We've had more participation in our town halls than ever before, with some town halls capping at 140 parents, which is a major achievement for us. Um, we've had meetings and surveys in both English and Spanish and online English learner advisory um, committee meetings. And we've also made efforts to ensure all of our stakeholders are able to engage in these town halls and, and family engagement efforts. We've distributed 1,200 Chromebooks to every single student. We have um, delivered hotspots for families who are having connectivity challenges. And then we've shifted our help desk and technical support um, structure so that we're able to deliver more support directly to families and students. Our surveyed data from all of our stakeholders has been pretty consistent. So from our students, we got the feedback that their biggest barriers to learning were other responsibilities, no quiet place to work, and not sure what to do, and they needed more feedback and direction from our teachers. Parents felt very strongly, I'm sure many of you who are online right now can relate, to a need for more routine and more structure, recorded classes, and mandatory participation. The top priorities for staff and families were very much aligned. Student health, mental health support, and then connecting with peers. So we've, if you've watched your students online, you may have seen the ways in which we're trying to create spaces where they can still feel safe and connected both with their teachers and staff and with their peers. Just if you're joining us now and you want to see the interpretation in Spanish, please go ahead and click on the interpretation button right down at the bottom and then select Spanish and we're having simultaneous Spanish translation for anyone who's joining us now. So, um, in making our plans, one thing we had to consider was how might in-person lo learning look during a pandemic? Like, what's possible? So, in, in putting these plans together, we considered um, feedback from families and from students and from teachers and staff. And we also looked at guidance from experts, so the Department of Health, um, the California Department of Education in trying to figure out like what's the best way to, to get students in a face-to-face -face situation, but also keep everybody safe. So we developed safety protocols, and many of these will probably look familiar to you from, from your visits to grocery stores and similar, right? How do we keep uh, safe distancing? Um, how do we have good safety procedures like mask wearing and temperature checks and health screening? Um, how do we make sure that our sites are being cleaned more frequently and that uh, the ventilation is, is as good as it possibly can be? Go ahead. Um, this summer, our, oh, I should explain that part of the plan is the actions and ideas of the plan, but another important part of the plan is describing how we're spending uh, the money. So how we're going to use our budget to really make these things happen. And this is an example of that. So the very first row is describing one of the actions we took in, prep, in preparation for in-person uh, uh, learning. And that's we had our home office and our site engineers work on the sites, make sure that the campuses were ready to be safely opened. And we had to spend between ten dollars and $11,000 doing that. You'll see a range on the right-hand side under funds, and that's because um, the campuses are all a little bit different in size, so the numbers aren't exactly the same way. Um, 
puesto dinero para asegurarnos de pagarles a los empleados que no andaban trabajando durante el mes de julio para uh, to work in July who normally wouldn't work in July to really think about what are good strategies and structures for hybrid learning for learning in person and learning distance learning at the same time Okay, so for in-person instruction, and number one is what we've done, and what, what we've pretty much completed. We've improved our cleaning. Uh, we set it up so it's easier for folks to wash their hands. Um, we have a system now for doing health screenings. When you come onto campus, you'll be asked questions. You'll have your temperature taken with a no-touch thermometer. They've put up plexiglass screens. And we're just beginning now to pilot uh, having one student and one teacher on campus at the same time. Um, I'm, usually this is for some sort of assessment, required legal assessment, but it gives us a chance to start slowly bringing students onto campus and working in, and experiencing these safety protocols. And our plan is to very slowly increase both the, the number of students on campus and the number of groups of students on campus as we move towards hybrid learning. After every change, we'll be asking families and teachers and staff members, like, how did it go? Were there any issues? Making sure that we're, we're perfecting the system every time we make an adjustment to size. And we'll be checking with the health department in case their guidance changes and slowly expanding. When we do get larger groups of students on campus, they'll be in what they call stable cohorts, which means if you have a group of 12 students, those 12 students stay with each other all day long and you don't let those cohorts mix because that's much safer if you have separate groups. Eventually we'll get to a place where we'll have between 60 and 120 students on campus at a time. So for our next section, if you just joined us and you would like to have translation, we're doing translation simultaneously and you can access translation in Spanish by clicking on the button at the bottom that says translation and then selecting Spanish. And now I'll pass it to Danielle. Hi everyone, my name is Danielle Kelsick. I'm the Chief Academic Officer at Environmental Charter Schools um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about distance learning. So as Cami described, we've got plans in place for how to slowly uh, return kids back to campus when it's safe, but because we don't know when that will happen, we've been concentrating a lot of our energy and budget on how to get good at distance learning, how to ensure that your students are learning even though it's happening at home. Um, and in the, if you were with us last spring, um, you will probably have noticed that a lot of changes happened. Uh, since the new school year began. That's because we spent the summer um, really trying to think about how to improve our program, given that we don't know how long uh, students will be doing distance learning. So we got together groups of leaders and teachers um, uh, to help us think through these three categories that are on the slide. Instruction, um, student support systems and operations. All of these three pieces need to interact together to make sure that we have an effective and equitable distance learning system. One of the things that came out of the research and the work we did over the summer uh, was a recognition that we needed to spend some money on both um, platforms that will enhance learning from home and um, equipment technology uh, to support students as they're uh, doing distance learning. So you'll see here on this slide, this depicts some of the platforms that we have invested in and some of them you might know already because your children are using them um, daily. So um, Nearpod is a platform that allows for uh, a teacher to share a presentation, a video, and students can interact with it. And the teacher can get information about what the students are writing and what they're understanding from the lesson. Actively Learn is another tool similar to that, but Actively Learn is focused on reading and text. So it's almost like a online library that allows students to comment on uh, their reading, highlight, communicate with their teacher and with their peers, all around a shared reading. Um, and then uh, we've also uh, 
you'll see other on this slide, there's other pictures here of Wi-Fi, um, computers, and headphones. All of these things um, are necessary for kids to access the, the material and to do it, um, to be able to concentrate. That's what the head headphones are for. Um, this slide here is really just depicting um, the cost of each of those things. Um, so the platforms that I described, the technology, and um, some of the additional technology. We, we oh, I forgot to say, um, we've invested in student technology and teacher technology because everyone's working from home. Um, people need more technology and devices than they did um, before. The other thing um, that, b besides the technology and the uh, platforms, we also knew that we would need to invest in support. So um, we've got a help desk, that's our IT service desk, um, here to help provide answers to questions for both students and teachers um, to be able to repair any equipment that's not working quickly so that there's no interruption to student learning. And then the other really important thing um, that besides the platform and the technology is really thinking about how do we adapt our program that uh, happens on campus to um, distance learning? How do we figure out how to do all of the things that are part of an ECS education online? And I see there's a question in the chat. Are we doing questions as we go or at the end? At the end. Okay, so um, so keep your questions coming. Please put them in the chat as we're talking and we'll address them after the presentation. This, um, this slide here is just uh, explaining the costs of those two pieces, the technical support and our whole um, professional development and approach to how do we translate what was happening on campus to online learning. You can see the costs in the right hand column. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I noticed quite a few people have joined us since we started. So before we go back in, I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that at the very bottom of your screen, if you want um, Spanish translation, you can click on the interpretation button in the bottom and um, get an interpretation. My name is Farnaz Golshani and I'm the Chief Executive Officer at Environmental Charter Schools and we're so grateful that so many people have joined us tonight. And we're going towards the end of presenting our um, learning plan for this year. And as we head towards the end of the presentation, we'll have an opportunity to hear questions from from everyone and to respond to the questions that are coming through in the chat. But make sure you take notes of questions that you have throughout and we welcome them as we go along. I'm handing can, off to- Can you hear me if I say it in English right now? You can hear me now. Voy a traducir en español ahorita para que me escuchen si acaban de llegar a la junta. Another real key, key part of the plan is how we're addressing a pupil learning loss, um, which is just that, that simple question of there was so much going on in the spring, um, students may have, have fallen behind. And how do we address that? So one real key way is by having what we call an intervention system. And this is like a safety net for students that may have fallen behind. At the very bottom uh, level, the all level, is, is in putting in all the supports that we think students should have all the time. The next level are for students who need additional supports. And then the top level is if students aren't being successful, even when they're re receiving the additional supports, then a few students end up getting even more intensive targeted supports. And we're, we're planning on providing those supports in the area of attendance, um, social emotional needs, academics, and then just distance learning challenges. Since it's a new um, situation for all of us, just specific targeted support in distance learning is also part of our system. And then in terms of funding, uh, the intervention program funds things like um, additional time for teachers to provide intervention, it funds additional counseling resources, and then as part of our addressing uh, students falling behind, we had an expanded summer school this year. And then we're also using uh, certain data tools to help us pay attention to how students are doing. So we know if, if our strategies are working, we can catch students quickly if they're falling behind, and we can evaluate um, 
how much better distance learning we're getting. And then finally, um, certain aspects of our educational program were really designed to meet the needs of our community. At the middle school, specialty classes help to engage students and reinforce the content and skill they learned in their core classes, and those will be continuing in distance learning. And then at the high school, they're making slight adjustments to their college prep program to provide more targeted support to ninth and 10th graders, really explicitly teaching them how to be effective distance learners. So even though this might be temporary in terms of the pandemic, um, we know that more and more colleges are also offering distance learning classes. So it's important for those ninth and 10th graders to get those skills. And then we'll be continuing as we always do to provide support for our uh, upperclassmen on the college application process. If you're joining us now, um, make sure to click the interpretation button down at the bottom if you want to hear this in Spanish. And as you can see, our principal, Dave Trejo, is, is interpreting this live right now for us, and we're so grateful for him. <laughs> so the next piece is um, our mental health and emotional well-being component of our learning continuity and an attendance plan. So. As you look at this, you, you might remember from the surveying that we did of our parents and our staff and our, our students, it was really clear that mental health and emotional well being is a priority for everyone involved. And so we really looked at best practices to deliver social emotional services and social emotional curriculum to our students this year um, to provide and um, best practices and how they can practice healthy coping skills and executive fun functioning skills through our curriculum. And as you can see, this is a big component of our plan. It's both the development of the plan and the implementation of it. And really this component of our plan will serve our English learners, our low income students and foster students and our homeless students. The idea is that this is for this is the mechanism through which we hope to support and capture the students, as you saw on Cami's triangle, um, our tier two and tier three students who need more support and emotional programming, counseling, and restorative practices. So um, this element of our plan you have hopefully already begun to experience so if you've received texts from your teacher or from your principal that automatically translate from english to spanish and then from you translate from spanish to english so that your teacher can re regularly communicate with you that's our new system talking points that we've implemented and as you can see with zoom we're experimenting with live translation services and we're trying to do our best to find more ways of communicating with parents more frequently. In addition to that, um, we're hopeful that our work that we're doing with Dr. Kenjus Watson and Dr. Tiffany Marie to confront anti-Blackness and racism is really also going to strengthen our ability to communicate and engage our community. Um, I'm bringing back to this because I said this was one of our priorities and if you joined us more recently, you didn't get to hear us talk about our three priorities. But one of our priorities for this year is confronting anti-blackness and racism. We've been doing this work for many years, but it's clear that we're not doing enough. Um, we started this work many years ago. We have an equity and diversity committee of our board that includes staff and parents and teachers. But it's clear that we need to take a deep look into our organization and see how we can make our mission come to alive. Our mission statement was adapted two years ago. Um, we aspire to sorry, we aspire to reimagine public education in low income communities of color to prepare conscious critical thinkers who are equipped to graduate from college and create a more equitable and sustainable world. And if you've seen our mission statement, this is a bold statement. And with that reality that we're, we have such a powerful mission statement, we need to do more to meet the needs of all students. And we have not been successful at meeting the needs of our African American and black students. We've also heard feedback from some staff that we've not been able to address their needs. 
So this year we are doing a listening tour. We're collecting data from parents and students with hopes that we can collect data and understand what do we need to do structurally and systemically in our schools so that we can better meet the needs of our students. So with that, um, we open up to you for questions and feedback, anything that you're at, you want to ask us about, we open up for that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a second, but if you want, these are our three email addresses. Again, I'm Farnaz, the CEO, and then we have Danielle Kelsick, who's the Chief Academic Officer, and Cami Kotler, who's the Director of Strategic Initiatives. You're welcome to email us directly if you want to write down our email addresses. And I'm going to stop share so that we can um, see all the questions that pop up on the screen and in the chat. So. There was a question while I was presenting about headphones, noise canceling headphones for students. Yeah, the question was uh, how the how we can get those noise canceling headphones and also what the cost is. Um, the cost is no cost, it's free. And as far as getting those headphones, um, your schools have had uh, regular distribution dates across the last few weeks. Um, and I would inquire with your school main offices to uh, be able to know what the next time you could pick up the headphones. Um, there is a possibility of, of going to the school and picking up the headphones uh, outside of the distribution dates. We welcome any questions you guys have. You're welcome to chat the questions in, um, by clicking on the button at the bottom and then clicking on chat. Or if you prefer, you're welcome to unmute yourself and, and ask a question. Another question just came in. Yeah. Um, related to hotspots, is there an expiration date for the hotspots? Um, there's no expiration date. Uh, we're going to keep them active as long as uh, we have our schools uh, in, uh, in closure. So um, the hotspots will stay good. And if you do have any problems with the hotspots, if they're not performing up to your needs, um, also get in contact with your school main office and they will help you out and we'll get you a new hotspot. I just want to reinforce that because I've understood that a lot of students, some students keep falling off of um, their Zoom classes. And it's really a priority for us to get every student online without challenges with the internet. So if you're having trouble with this, please contact our help desk, contact your main office. They can help you access um, technology supports to improve internet connectivity. Also to piggyback off of that, um, I know that Miguel Gammons is going to send a message out to the high school, but I think it's also important to remember that the hotspots are, um, have limited space on them. And so they're meant for just school use only. So if you know that your student is streaming videos or um, doing other things that require a lot of bandwidth, that could be the reason why their internet is starting to slow down. Um, so that's something to consider as well. And Jeremiah, I don't know if uh, you wanted to speak to that anymore. I think that covers it. You know, um, these devices, these hotspots really are only meant to have the maximum one or two people on them so that they can access Zoom. And so uh, we really want to limit how often or how many people can access them. Um, there were a couple of other questions that came in and some in Spanish. Uh, one of them is, uh, it's the same question about the, the headphones. Um, where and when can I pick them up? And um, the answer is uh, they can be picked up at your school. Um, there are regular distribution dates, but to find out what those upcoming dates are, um, please call your school main office and, and they can help you out with that. So there's a question about will students return to school in the fall? So as of right now, um, we are following the guidance to, provided by the um, Department of Public Health, both in California and at, at the Los Angeles level. And they're um, delivering guidance that we can um, bring in one student at a time right now for assessments as needed, as Cami presented. 
And then we're gonna be assessing gradually whether or not we can bring small cohorts later in the year to come on campus and gain support and resources. We're gonna be doing some small testing groups soon as well. Um, our hope is that we're gonna be able to have some time, more time together even in this school year. And we're gonna provide feedback and updates to you as soon as we have information about the next steps. I, I'm hoping that you've been receiving feedback from your principals every two to three weeks that provides guidance on where the LADPH is at this moment. And really we're gonna be reacting to the situation and um, providing services in person as soon as we can. Cami, did you wanna add anything to that? No, I, I think it's, it's, it's a balance, right? Because we, we miss your kids and we wanna see them on our campuses but we also have to follow the guidance being given to us by the health experts, which is really limits the number of students we can have on campus. And we also wanna respect the feedback we've gotten from, from families about how important health is to you all. So we wanna be sure that as we gradually increase from one student on campus to three students on campus at this beginning stage, um, that, that we're, we're doing everything as safely as it humanly can be done. I heard that someone has their hand raised. Um. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, thank you, Kali. Yes, um, so when are you going to know what child or the three children that will be able to go on campus? When are we gonna know that? Because my son needs a lot of help and a lot of attention. Um, he has an IEP, so sitting at the Zoom all day long, it's not, it's not working for us. <laughs> Yeah, you, you'll be happy to hear, Colleen, that the, the guidance we were receiving is that the first students on campus would be students um, with IEPs, students who might be English learners, um, or the way that the, the state describes it as vulnerable students. So we really need to start with kids who have the highest needs first, um, and that's exactly how we're ramping up. So beginning with IEP assessments um, that have been delayed and are, are are violating compliance laws and then slowly but surely increasing to, so that we're able to help the kids who need the most help. Okay, so you should know like maybe by next month because I know I have an IEP actually tomorrow with everybody, um, his teachers and the principal um, and the IEP. So like maybe next month you'll know or? Yeah, I, I would, I would, I would think yes. Like we're 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 doing one to one assessment right now. It's begun, um, and then we'll move from there to small groups. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Colleen. We had a couple of hands raised. Uh, we'll go to Evelyn first, and then Erica. Evelyn, can you hear us? Okay, uh, we'll go to Erica then. Hi. Hi, Erica. Hi, yes. Um, um. Oh no, I cut out, Erica. Did you accidentally mute yourself again, possibly? Let me see, maybe. Oh yes, yes. Okay, yes, my question is how soon um, our senior is going to start applying for college and if there's going to be a meetings for that. Yeah, so I know that um, at the high school we're coordinating uh, family nights and college application processes um, right now. So you should be hearing about that very soon. Um, and you can also ask your student to ask Ms. Roxanne Solomita, who um, teaches the senior seminar course. Um, all students who are seniors should be involved in that or enrolled in that course. So if they have any questions, they could ask her. Um, you could also reach out to her directly via email to ask her for more information. Um, and if you want, I, you could also put your email in the chat box and I can send your email to Ms. Solomita so she can reach out to you. ECS team, if you guys could introduce yourselves before you speak as well so that everyone who hasn't had the fortune of meeting you before could get to know you. It looks like Evelyn put her question in the chat. And the question is, how in advance are you going to let us know when they are coming back? Will 
this be like a hybrid section? Kami, do you want to? Sure. It, it has to be a hybrid section because during the pandemic, we're limited in the number of students we can have on campus. Um, so, so when when we get to the most kids we can have on campus, it will be a, a hybrid. So some students will be in distance learning and some students will be on campus. Um, the timing of how it will unfold is not determined because we need to do it in a step-by-step -step fashion and be examining how each step is going. We've never done this before, just like you've never done this before. And I totally understand your frustration and, and your desire to have really specific commitments from us, like in six weeks this will happen, in eight weeks this will happen. But we don't want to promise if we can't deliver. And it's really hard to make promises when, um, when we haven't ever brought students on campus in a pandemic before, right? Everything we're doing right now is new for us. And it's really important that we do it well and we don't make any mistakes because students' health and st staff health is part of, the, part of the picture. So we're just gonna move uh, deliberately. We will try to communicate with you frequently so you can see what our intentions are in terms of how we're progressing and you can follow our progress. Um, if your students come on campus, you may be asked to give feedback on how it went. So you'll be part of the progress and, and the process of figuring out how to do it the best way possible. If anyone has anything to add, feel free. I think it's also really important to know that um, we're in an ever-changing environment and get new feedback every day. So um, you're seeing our budget now. We've been through five different iterations of our budget based on the feedback that we got from the state about what funding sources would be available to us and how to shift our planning and what needs we need to meet. At the same time as we've had multiple budgets to plan, we've also gotten daily feedback of when we can do each action and then there's a regression. So a couple of weeks ago, they said, it's okay to bring one student on campus to do assessments, you can begin that. And then they retracted on that for a few days and then again allowed it. So it's just it's a constant um, ebb and flow and watching how the virus is progressing in LA County. LA continues to be a hotspot, even though there's been some decline in the rates of infection. Um, we, we have to be more cautious and we're um, gonna continue to follow best practices and listen to the guidance we get from the Department of Public Health. What I'll say is from uh, an academic kind of instructional perspective, we're working on improving distance learning. Um, and, and that is because that's the thing that's foreign to us. When we get kids back on campus, we know what to do. Um, and we're gonna be really excited for that opportunity. But our efforts are trying to figure out and, and troubleshoot the challenges of distance learning. So if there's specific challenges that your child is experiencing, please reach out to the main office. Make an appointment with your student's counselor with your um, school's principal so we can understand what the challenges are and um, and tell you we're working on that or we didn't realize that was a problem we want to address that so please communicate with us because what we can't control is the spread of the virus and the rules that come down to us from la county and from the state but what we can control is uh, how we're delivering instruction we can get better and better at it and your feedback your your complaints that actually helps us do better so so please like keep the communication lines open share with us what the challenges are so that we can address them and get better and better there's a related question that came in through the Q&A feature it's when you gradually open up who are the students who will attend first the instruction that we've received um, is to begin with students who have the highest level of need and, and that's defined for us um, as students with uh, exceptionality, students who have IEPs, students who are English learners, and then students who are defined as vulnerable. Um, so that would mean that the people who are having the hardest time accessing distance learning and being successful in distance learning would be the students who would be prior to who would come on first. The eventual goal 
when we reach hybrid would be that that all kinds of students at different points in time would be coming onto campus and kind of a rotation right that that's the the long-term hybrid goal the um but what we don't know is as we progress towards being hybrid, whether or not the virus will cooperate with us, right? As other schools open and bring students on campus, there's always the chance that virus numbers will, will tick up again. And we know for sure that when we're in hybrid and when we have all kinds of different kids coming in little groups and cohorts onto campus on different days and different schedules, that we're still gonna have students doing distance learning because we can't bring everybody back to school at the same time. So that's why it's so important that we get better at distance learning and that we help your students get better at distance learning. Because there's no way of avoiding it. While the pandemic's happening, there's going to be at least some distance learning happening all the time. And then if the pandemic gets worse, we would be sliding into more distance learning and fewer students on campus. I, I just want to emph empathize with you as a mother of a middle schooler. My daughter said to me um, this week that if she could only know that she was coming to school once in the next month, she would spend the whole month looking forward to that day. And we feel the same way. It's so hard. I see our teachers and this is such a different medium for them to be educating your students. And my child is eager to come back. I'm sure your kids are eager to come back, but we are just as eager to come back to them. It's, we're all people who are drawn to these careers because we love to be surrounded by children and to hear their laughter in the halls and, and to engage with them and support and inspire them. And so this is not how we wanna be doing this work. And our first moment possible, we're gonna do the best that we can to be back together with your children and to be able to strengthen our instruction in person. Are we seeing any other questions that have come through? There was one other question asked a little bit earlier. Uh, the question was, what about 504 plan? Uh, students who have 504 plans who um, would also fall in that category of students who might need extra support, especially, and, and, and you know, students with IEPs and students with 504 plans, that's a whole bunch of different kinds of students, right? But the main idea is that the, the plan would be to prioritize groups of students who are struggling and who have extra needs. So that would include students with 504 plans who are having trouble with distance learning. I saw a comment that yes, we want to come back to normal and I just want to agree with you sincerely. We are all desperate to come back to normal. Thank mm -hmm. you. And thank you for, um, I saw some comments about, thank you for all we do. We, we, this is work of love. I wanna tell you this whole team of people who you're seeing in front of you has been working um, 60, 70 hours a week all throughout the summer because we've had to recreate how we do education and create new systems for everything we do and new structures and their quality of work um, I have not seen any other schools where the quality of work can compare to even anything that I'm seeing at ECS. It's inspiring. And um, I'm grateful that we've had the forethought as a team to really focus on distance learning. I think a lot of people re were running their wheels throughout the summer to figure out how to plan for hybrid and they really didn't plan to do distance learning well. And I am in awe of how much our distance learning program has adapted over the last some over the summer and has evolved. And I'm really grateful for the team and their leading leadership of all of our teachers and the impact that it's having. Any questions? Don't hesitate to raise your hands or put them in the chat. We miss, yeah. <laughs> There's a question in the Q&A. Who determines which students should be first to attend school? The first entity that, um, the directions come to us. And for us, is it the state or the, or the county, county Department of Health? From the County Department of Public Health. So the, the instructions about students with IEPs, students who are English learners, vulnerable students, that, that comes from the LA County Department of Health. So they say right now, those are the students we can slowly begin to have like one-to-one -one 
one to three, those, those kinds of configurations of students is where we start. Um, once they give us permission to have more students on campus, then we'd be shifting towards eventually having, I mean, our, our, our goal and our dream is to be able to have all your kids on campus, right? Um, but, but we can't do it all at once. And right now we can't do it, period, right? We can only bring very small numbers on at this point in time. There's a and question about, oh, sorry. Go ahead, it's okay. Mm -hmm. There's a question about whether or not there's still gonna be holiday breaks and the answer is yes. Um, our calendar is still the calendar that we sent to you earlier in the year and last year, and we're going to have similar holiday breaks like Thanksgiving and Christmas. So please look forward to spending some time with your family without a computer in hand. Mm -hmm. I'm really personally looking forward to taking my kids' computers away from them. <laughs> I just want to reiterate the invitation to, to connect with your um, your main office with your principal about challenges you're having both like when we send out formal surveys please fill them out we use that information to do planning but also if there's if it's between a survey um, pick up a phone call write an email send a text that information really helps us because of this situation, there's more disconnection than, than we've ever experienced in school. Um, so it's, you're not um, causing a problem or, or, or being annoying by, by connecting with us. Um, just like you could you used to be able to walk into the main office and talk to somebody, that's not possible, but we still want to hear um, about your needs and how we can support. Somebody asked what's going to happen if a student gets COVID-19 once in school. I want you to know that we have worked really hard to develop a very thorough and um, detailed protocol through which we're going to track any cases um, and work with the Department of Public Health to inform them because they would support us in case tracking. Um, if a student who is in the small cohort or is in a group of three with your, your child and they contract COVID-19, you would be informed that your child has been in touch with someone who has COVID-19 and then you would have to take the precaution of keeping your student at home um, for the quarantine period. Um, what we're trying to do by going extremely slow and um, collecting feedback and using all the PPE, the protective equipment and keeping six, six feet distance, if not more, and masks and in some places visors and screens. We're, we're implementing all these things to protect your child and to protect our staff so that our students won't go through the experience of open enclosure. Um, what, what we believe is that if we're continuing to deliver distance learning, your children will have a more constructive educational experience than if they come to, if we open close, open close. So we're being very cautious to pay attention to the, um, the needs of all students in this context. And we will um, let all parents be aware if they've been in touch with a student who's had it or a staff member who, who's had it and then um, will go down the path of um, taking all the necessary precautions. There's another question that came in through the Q&A. Will college requirements be communicated through the senior seminar class in regards to submission and acceptance? Seniors still have to be accepted into at least one college in order to graduate, correct? So we actually just found out recently in like the past year or so that um, legally we can't require a student to be accepted to a four-year university in order to graduate. So we still encourage our students to apply to schools and be accepted, um, but it's no longer a requirement and it cannot legally hold them back from graduating. But we'll still provide all the supports necessary in order to get them to a place where they can apply to all the schools that they want to um, and hopefully be accepted to um, many schools. And Casey, is Senior Seminar the place where all that lives? Yes. So Senior Seminar um, is where all the students will literally be taken step by step through the entire college application process and the financial aid process, whether it's for the FAFSA or for the DREAM 
uh, Act. And we're also going to be holding parent nights um, so that you can learn exactly how to support your students in filling out all that paperwork, um, especially for financial aid. They're, they will need some information from you. Um, and we're also going to have individual meetings with every parent and their student, as we always do, to make sure that you understand the financial aid process and the college application process um, just as much as your student. Um, and as always, those meetings are totally confidential because we know that you share some sensitive information in those documents. And we will always respect that confidentiality, even if it means us not listening to certain parts while you're talking to your student. Um, but we just want to make sure that we have that face-to-face, -face well, face-to-face -face interaction with you and your students so that um, everyone's on the same page about what the requirements are, what every step is, and so that you understand um, kind of what your students are going through and exactly what it entails to not only apply to college, but be accepted and then hopefully go um, in the fall. And I want to say as, as the parent of two former ECHS graduates, um, it's amazing. The process is amazing. They, they are so helpful to the kids and it makes it so much easier on you as a parent. Um, it really is step by step. So just pay attention to what they ask you to do and it's, it, it's a great system. We had another question come in through the Q&A. Uh, the question is related to hybrid learning. Once that type of learning starts, will students be learning, how does it work for students to be learning in class and from home, you know, different students, and will it be live learning? We're in the process of developing a, a plan for this. Um, it will include a combination of live learning and in-person learning um, with staggered schedules on different days. And um, we're really thinking that it's going to be multiple models of distance learning first before we move to a hybrid learning model. So well, right now we're in distance learning with one student coming in at a time for assessments. We may have times when small cohorts of three to six students come in just to meet their teachers and connect with some peers. And, and we'll gradually from that um, eventually get to a hybrid structure where students come on, on varied days or have on and off schedules. Um, we're gonna provide more detail on that as it gets closer. Um, one person asked whether or not we would be providing masks when students come and safety materials. So um, the, the cloth face masks that students are expected to wear every day and wash and return with another cloth face mask, um, we will not be providing. So our hope is that, that students already have them at home and they'll continue to have those. But if a student needs to have like a face screen or other safety materials, we would be able to support the provision of that stuff. Um, Kimmy, is there any more, like if a student forgets a mask and shows up and of course we'll have masks for students who didn't bring one on the day that they arrive. But um, our hope is since that the expectation is that students will have several cloth masks and wash them every day and wear a new one, um, we're not gonna be providing that. I, I, we're in a time where that cloth mask is kind of like your t-shirt, right? Yeah. It's expected wherever you go. And certainly families, if they were struggling to, to, to find t-shirts or afford t-shirts, we would help them. Same thing will be true with cloth masks. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um. There's a question about whether student personal information will be shared with the Department of Health, I think in the case of um, contact tracing. For contact tracing, we are required by the Department of Public Health to share the names and the phone numbers of people who have been infected. Um, someone from the contact um, tracing team at LADPH would then call the parent of the student and would say, who has your child been in touch with? And they would try to be able to contact all of the people your child has been in person in touch with so that they could prevent further spread. Yeah, we, we um, someone asked, they said, if, parent, if a child is sick, we have to really reinforce that they need to keep their children, that people need to keep their children at home. As you saw in the spring, we sent a lot of messages about please keep your children at home, please make sure they wash their hands 
frequently. Those messages will now be visible in signs all throughout our campuses. Um, on top of that, no one will be able to enter a campus if they have a fever. There, it's, there's going to be a questionnaire that they have to answer and they're going to have their temperature checked before they could actually enter a campus. Um, so we're taking a lot of precautions. We're going to be communicating and continuing to communicate regularly with parents. And um, it's really critical. I mean, the most important, um, we saw the director of the CDC, the national CDC say that the most important measures that can protect us at this time are masks, staying at home if you're sick and washing your hands frequently. Have I missed any questions, guys, or are there any? There's a question in the Q&A, two questions in the Q&A. One is high school, I think, but maybe not, maybe all schools. Have the requirements for completion of community service been waived for the school year? What can we expect for teacher-parent conferences? Will they be Zoom calls with each teacher or just a counselor? That's two questions, I think. Yeah, so I just, uh, I was typing as uh, we were answering, um, but, or sorry, as Danielle was explaining it, but yes, we are gonna have our parent conferences on Zoom as long as uh, distance learning is happening. And um, our, currently our community service requirements are waived because it's so difficult to find community service opportunities um, during COVID and distance learning. Um, I also see uh, a question about dress code for masks. Um, I'm gonna, say no, <laughs> um, that's fine. We just want kids to wear masks and uh, as long as they have one, then we support it. It doesn't need to match the color palette or the dress code, but thank you for asking. <laughs> and that same goes for Inglewood as well. Um, we will be having parent teacher conferences via Zoom. And when it comes to our community service requirement, yes, there are still community service, but we're asking them to do it within their homes. Um, anything that will have a positive impact in your home, if you're able to facilitate a game night, or maybe clean out a room or support a parent with an activity that you normally don't do, um, that will be considered your way of possibly contributing to your household. And then you, um, you would write a brief review about how that made you feel. And then uh, the adult who participated with you gets to sign off. So there was a question. Someone said, sorry, joined late, just got home from work. Um, we can all relate as we're all still at work and we empathize with you. So uh, of course, um, they asked if we, if, um, kids are going back to school and you know this is a very long answer for you we've done a in the presentation we talked largely about the fact that we are staying in distance learning and we're very gradually returning um, to in-person instruction over a long period of time um, and the first steps of that is what's happening right now is we're doing assessments of students with exceptionalities um, the D LA Department of Public Health has given us permission to soon bring small cohorts of students in for additional assessments like the LPAC and other assessments that are required by law to occur now. And then gradually in the next month, hopefully by mid-November, if um, the infection rates continue to stay low, they said it has to stay low or reduce over the next month, um, we might be able to bring small cohorts of students like um, six at a time to eventually 12 at a time on campus. But this is going to be a long, uh, a long and slow process. <laughs> and um, as, as we expressed many times throughout this presentation, we are so eager to have your kids back on campus. We miss them so much and we're looking forward to a time when we can see the kids walking by the creeks and, and um, playing in our, in our um, playing and sitting on the stoops and eating and um, interacting with each other. It's just such a, it's so sad to walk through our campuses right now without students there. So we are all very eager to have them back. I see a hand raised by Mia. Yes. And let me unmute you here. Can you hear us, Mia? Hi, yes. Hi, Mia. Thank you. I just joined because I was out. Let me mute myself because I have a puppy. Did you have a question, Mia? No, actually, I'm just joining right now. Well, welcome. Thank you for joining us. 
I think, Jeremiah, is this being recorded? So if anybody missed parts of it or just joining now, they can catch up? Yes, it is. And we'll distribute the recording over the next few days. I'm noticing as people are gradually getting off the phone um, and that we've hit our seven o'clock time for the end of our time together. Um, in our presentation, we shared our emails. We'll share this presentation with everyone as a recording. But once again, we welcome any questions, any feedback that you have. And um, we look forward to having a time when we can all be back together. And we hope that it'll happen sooner rather than later. Thank you all so much for taking time out of your nights to be with us. And I also really wanna thank my amazing team of leaders and teachers and, and principals who are here, all of whom have, um, many of whom have children at home that you may have seen throughout the presentation, but they're phenomenal. And I'm so grateful for the leaders that we have here. And Jeremiah, David, thank you so much for all the work that you did to coordinate the talk and also, Dave Trejo, thank you so much for your translation. I and mean, just to be such a team player and be willing to translate live in this way is such a gift. So thank you, Dave. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Good night. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Good night.